this is Hetil, the singer of Green Carnation. Uh, you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. <laughs> I should tell you that I have been a Green Carnation fanboy since uh, Blessing in Disguise came out, oh. and uh, and I have been fortunate. I, I've lived in the United States my whole life, and I've been fortunate enough to see you guys three times uh, in concert. Oh, really? Yeah. You must be one of the guys in the U.S. that has seen us most times in the U.S. Then. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. I know some people that have traveled uh, quite a bit more than I have. But, well, uh, I remember a few, a few, a few guys on the tour, um, tour in 2006 that were following us by almost like by by plane almost. <laughs> <laughs> now I didn't do that, but I did see you in Austin with the gathering, and oh, really? and then in San Antonio with the helicopters. Oh, that one! Wow. Yeah, I I interviewed you in short at that show. Mm, mm. Did, did we do that in the in like a backyard or something? Yeah, I was like in a driveway while yeah yeah while the helicopters were playing. Yeah, I remember. Yep, that was me, dude. Oh, cool! <laughs> <laughs> it's good to talk to you again. <clears throat> same to you. Same to you. <laughs> well, wow. Yeah. So so like so we we have a lot of listeners that are not familiar with Green Carnation. And first of all, I think that they should do something about that. <laughs> yeah, that's and, nice. And secondly, they should know that Green Carnation does not sound at all how your pedigree might suggest. Because like, cause like Chort was an emperor many years ago, and he did Carpathian Forest. You yeah. and Jonathan were in Trail of Tears together. Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You've got connections to Tristan Nia. You sing for them, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but you guys don't sound like any of those bands. No, that's true. It's like... Um... I guess I've been I've been thinking quite a lot about that. What where does the uh, sound come from? Uh, and it's always it, in any band, uh, which isn't like a, a band that like one guy, uh, you know, decides everything and well, and people are basically like hired guns. But in all bands that are like a democracy, I think yeah, I think any band would sound like you know the sum of the people in the band. Um, uh, our bass player Stan Rogo, who's also uh, writing quite a lot of of the songs and also ly- lyrics, he's uh, he's a mix between like he's he's into old Black Sabbath and um, and he's also in, like he writes these pop choruses and he's he's got a kind of a poppy way to think music as well and maybe I think I might be I might be the the most you know guy pulling it in the progressive direction. And then you have short, which has two musical identities, I think, which is obviously one is the black metal thing, but one is also a very Pink Floydish uh, person, a musical personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a keyboard player who is from the blues world, basically. Yeah, and and yeah, you know, and the drummer uh, Jonathan is originally from Chile, so so he's got like this kind of slightly different uh, approach to many things as well, maybe because of his heritage. I don't know. So we all have our uh, like uh, individual musical identities, but, but also I think within our musical identity, we all have something that's um, that comes together in green carnation. Yeah. There, there's definitely a unique chemistry that you guys have that, uh, that I think allows you to do things that uh, I'm not sure other bands are brave enough to try. Like, like for example, the first time I saw you guys um, was was in that 2006 tour uh, in yeah. Austin with the Gathering. Yeah, um, you guys didn't actually play anything from uh, the acoustic verses that night, but you did do an extended jam of Lullaby and Winter. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 yeah. Mm. And, and your keyboardist Kenneth, he topped it off with an incredible saxophone solo, and that's just not a thing that was heard at the time. 
<laughs> no, it was great fun actually. Uh, we we changed inter- instruments. I even did some. I think I played some keyboards and and the bass player and guitarist. Or like during that tour, we just uh, expanded on that part of the show. And not not to be a, like a show off band because we're most definitely not, but just for just for giving the audience something they they might not you know uh, um, they might not expect. Uh, and the reason why we didn't do anything from the acoustic verses on the on the Austin like, South by Southwest show was actually that all the acoustic instruments were delayed in in the travel over from from um, from Norway. Oh no. We didn't get the acoustic guitars before the last third of the tour or something, I think. Oh, if I remember. no. Yeah. I didn't realize that that tour was that jacked up. Mm. Yeah, there was a lot of things happening on that tour. But, you know, after a few years, you tend to remember the good memories, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like it, – because it, you guys you guys split up like maybe a year after that. And, yeah. and like it looked like it was a pretty ugly breakup. Um, like are you okay with talking about that? Yeah, 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 no problem. And we we be, we have been talking about that lately, and and uh, and obviously things uh, like when seeing it in retrospect, it, things kind of change a little bit, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've found out is basically the main reason why we broke up was was I think it was two reasons. I think we felt sorry for ourselves uh, not to be more successful. To be completely honest with you, mm-hmm. uh, because we were trying and trying and trying and trying and and. Of course, you shouldn't complain, but but I think maybe that was one of the reasons which we didn't think about at the time. Also, I think uh, one of the reasons was that we simply didn't know, and especially Jort didn't know where to go next because because I think when when thinking back on it, I think we were a band that lacked a little bit of direction uh, uh, when it com- comes to you know the art like the music. Uh, we were exploring, which was kind of what we wanted in that period. We were exploring different areas, different musical genres, different you know mm-hmm. ways to have different um, sources of inspiration all the time. But we never, maybe never figured out what is reincarnation, like what is the basis of the band, what do we want to achieve, and stuff like that. Now mm-hmm. it's easy to see to look back and, and see that those might have been the main problems. Uh, but short was has also been you know it was him who closed the door uh and he he um, basically just said we we we're over uh, and uh when talking to him about that now i think like we have like a common understanding that what was the problems uh of the time uh, but I, I do think that we honestly thought that we deserved better which is a bit sad but but mm-hmm. uh, yeah you know, so that's an awesome answer, yeah. I I absolutely agree that you guys deserve more uh, more success. Yeah, well, yeah, we're not the only band who's thinking that way. I'm sure, but yeah. I think all <laughs> basically all bands are thinking the same. But but when you had the other factors on the same time and and economically, we 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 did a disastrous uh, U.S. tour. To be honest with you, and mm-hmm. there was just so many things that you know when 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 there are more negatives than positives when playing in a band, it's maybe you should just you know call it a day and that's what we did yeah uh, i'd like to comment on what you just said um because like like you know having attended that tour twice um Mm -hmm. you know it was really really bittersweet in retrospect because like you guys were on fire i Mm. mean like like your performances i am not making this up your performances were transcendental and I promise you that even at that San Antonio show where you guys had to go on after the helicopters at like three in the morning or whatever, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you made new fans. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and also like it, it, it's interesting to hear that you guys thought that you lacked direction because one of the things that I thought set you above the fray was that you guys were always doing something different with each album. Yeah. You know, Light of yeah. Day was its own thing, and it was excellent. Blessing of Disguise was its own thing, and it was excellent, and so on and so forth. The Acoustic Verses, oh my God, that's one of my favorites of all time. <laughs> okay, thanks, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you could say that, like, we had a direction uh, when it comes, like, <clears throat> we've always been uh, asking, you know, we've always been uh, uh, expecting a lot from ourselves, you know, 
when it comes to quality, both uh, when recording albums and not least by playing live, of course. And so that was a direction, you know, like like a quality direction. But but the band didn't progress when it like it, like we hoped it would, you know. And we were, I think, constantly falling between two chairs when it came to is this you know metal music or is it rock music and it was in like in between there and and right there and then we didn't have the the knowledge to to kind of um that, that we have today i think when it comes to being strategic in in what to do and when to do it time everything and, and stuff like that it's something i guess that you learn, learn uh, mm-hmm. by getting older i guess so we have a much much more clear thought on what we want today uh, and that makes it also easier not to be disappointed by things because when when you know what you want you know what to achieve and you don't have to achieve everything else mm-hmm. you just want, you need to achieve what you want to achieve in order to 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 progress in the direction you want mm-hmm. and if you're not even sure what direction you want <laughs> then, then you're gonna have a problem you know yeah 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 it makes sense when you put it that way yeah plus maybe i think we're we're a bit more realistic today. We 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 know we're not going to be like a huge band, uh, mm-hmm. and that's not the aim. The aim is to to do exactly what we're doing now. Uh, we have planned this, you know, comeback period uh, really well. Obviously, there's a situation in the world today that nobody could have could have predicted. Um, yeah, which isn't going to ruin like and everything for us, but it's just going to need that we like we we need to sit down and 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 make some new new not new plans but we need to postpone the few things that we we had planned this year for example and and we just have to kind of adjust a little bit to our plans because we we do have plans now until the summer of 2023 ooh mm. ooh okay okay i'm listening <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, I, I i can't say exactly what it is yet oh. but uh can give a good hint maybe sure i'll i'll take whatever <laughs> you can give me <laughs> yeah, we signed a five album deal with Season of Mist. Oh. Um, and this um, this album is the first album, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, next year is the 15th anniversary of Acoustic Versus, so we're going to relaunch that with some new stuff on. And, and uh, it's a new master by. Yeah. By, uh, <laughs> Hold on. You just by, made me squeal by telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be some some tracks on some uh, bonus tracks on it, which wasn't on the original. And uh, uh, apart my, from the original too, yeah, yeah, and, and the original. There's going to be some slightly like like a new cover. Okay, uh, it's going to be released on vinyl. <gasps> and, I yeah, was just yeah. thinking today about how much I need to get that on vinyl. Like seriously, I was thinking about that two hours ago. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, cool. That's nice. So, so that's that's what we that's what we're going to do next year. Um, we also have since 2017, we've been working kind of short term and long term on the same time in the composing pro, uh, process, and we, we and we have three more albums after that, you know. So we're working on a big project that we're gonna announce at the end of the year, probably. Uh, I don't know because of, because of the current situation, but we plan to announce it maybe in September, October this year. But okay. we might have to wait a little bit with that, but. Okay. That's going to be a huge new recording process. That's going to include three albums. Okay, and are you at liberty to discuss that? Because I have questions. <laughs> yeah, you can you can ask. Uh, um, uh, I probably cannot okay. say everything yet, but yeah, you yeah, can okay. ask. I, I understand. Um, so, so when the acoustic verses came out, Short had mentioned that the next album was already written and that it was going to be called Chronicles of Doom. Hmm. Um, there's been, um, there's been the Chronicles of Doom has been talked about and maybe short of some, sometimes has, you know, um, confirmed that and told about that. And there's also been this, um, uh, the rise and fall of mankind, the trilogy. That was my next question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what we have done is that we've taken control over, over those, you know, rumors or whatever um about you know a trilogy and everything and we're gonna we're gonna tell the world what we want to do regarding that uh in maybe one year's time or half a year or something like that yeah okay cool i like the way this is going (laughs) yeah (laughs) 
now you guys you guys reunited in 2014 yeah. um with the acoustic versus lineup if i'm not mistaken but but your but one of your guitar players michael crumens and your drummer tommy jackson have both since left the band um mm-hmm. is everything okay like what's going on there yeah yeah um you know we we needed to when uh when planning the like today day of darkness anniversary you know mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, I don't think people understand how much work uh, that was behind that entire thing. I think we rehearsed for uh, almost one and a half years to be able to get that on the stage like we wanted it to. Okay, and to be clear, you're talking about uh, about the campaign launch, the you know the the uh, the performances that you did in Europe and in Atlanta and so forth. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was the 15th anniversary of, of uh, Light of Day, Day of Darkness. So we decided to do a full production of that, you know, quite epic song. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so we did that. Uh, we played that from A to Z. A to Z. Mm. And we couldn't have done that with uh, with any anybody, mm-hmm. you know. So we needed to put the people on stage that were, you know, best suitable to to be able to do what we wanted. That, therefore, we also had three guitarists that year. Mm-hmm. So it was Michael, uh, and it was Björn Hofstad, who's in the band now, and Short, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, and Björn is also the original um, guitarist mm-hmm. who came to the band in 2016 again because we needed his his sound because he's an important sound of Light of Day, Day of Darkness. Yeah. Uh, and also Enrich Kirchgesola, the, the producer of Light of Day, Day of Darkness, um, he joined us on keyboards because. Oh, oh okay, okay. I, I was yeah. going to ask who that was. Yeah, that's the that's the producer. Okay. Of the album, yeah. So, uh, and um, and we needed to, to uh, we needed Jonathan's uh, uh, Jonathan Paris's uh, qualities as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically, yeah, that's the reason because when you when you put like so much pressure on yourselves as we did with doing that because it's so like stupidly uh, ambitious that uh, <laughs> light of day day of darkness thing uh, we needed the, the like 100 percent the right personnel for, for doing it mm-hmm. and uh, after 2016 uh andres like contract was was over with us he's he's a producer and mm-hmm. he also produced of, of obviously uh, the new album but also, uh, Michael, uh, he moved to the Netherlands, mm. so it was a bit like difficult to to like. He's a professional guitarist, like to his like yeah. He's an incredible guitarist and very professional. So mm-hmm. we would have been able probably to play with him without rehearsing too much with him. Uh-huh. But then again, he's also uh, like a career person uh, that needs to earn money on playing, and he needs to work on his solo career mm-hmm. and it was so many obstacles so so we we decided that like for this next period and this next project we mm-hmm. we could only do it with two guitarists and uh, and it's not like he's never going to play in reincarnation again uh-huh. uh, but um but it's a little bit too much also to have three guitarists when we're doing what we're doing now also economically so there's some practical reasons as well yeah, that, like I was going to ask about that. Like, you guys have a really, really unique uh, situation with, you, you know, with uh, Bjorn and Michael because, because like, it kind of looks like they kind of come and go whenever they're needed or whenever they're able to do it. A little bit, yeah. It's been a little bit like that because Bjorn has been in and out and in again. Mm-hmm. Michael as well. <clears throat> but the thing is that it's funny because when Bjorn was playing in in the woods. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was this little kid uh, asking to to be allowed to sit in the studio and and see what they did and stuff, and that was Michael. Really? So, yeah. So Bjorn is like actually Michael's kind of mentor when it oh. comes to playing. So that's a luxury problem. Like problem for us is that we have two guys that are amazing guitarists and and um, uh, yeah. Uh, and Michael does obviously all these other things as well with the teremin and uh, and the know, bazooki, the bazooki, for example, and stuff that Bjorn doesn't do. But then again, mm-hmm. Bjorn has his his unique sound that he's one of the guys in the world that I I could I could hear mm-hmm. just by one tone that it was Bjorn Bjorn playing. So so yeah, so yeah, we, we have a we have a kind of a big you know a big family around the band yeah. and. Uh, 
and it might be that Andrei Kirkesola needs to come in to play some keyboards again. Sometimes we played with two keyboard players, mm -hmm. like we're touring with Light of Day, Day of Darkness back in the days. We had mm -hmm. two keyboard players, oh, one, okay. one playing mostly organ and one playing like synths and samples. Okay. So, so you never know. But uh, there are so many talented musicians around us that um, I think we're going to be okay. The, the Night Under the Dam DVD yeah. was such a delight and part of it was seeing <laughs> all these musicians joining you guys on stage and like yeah and honestly it's hard to tell who's who but mm. but everything came together so beautifully yeah that was a that was a crazy project we, we were a bit like um <laughs> more is more band when it comes to <laughs> doing extraordinary stuff i think um because we've never been afraid of doing like I said, like a little bit too much, if you know what I mean. It suits mm -hmm. the band. It suits everything that we we do. And um, I remember when coming, to, uh, I was one of the guys who had the under the damn idea together mm -hmm. with a guy who the, the the promoter of that thing. We live in a small city in in Norway with a hundred thousand people. Um, well, it's one of the biggest cities in Norway, but it's still just a hundred thousand people here. Right. And I I was I have a new idea to where we can play a gig, and then it's. You go by a car two hours north into the mountains, into a place with eight inhabitants, <laughs> and then you <laughs> and then you take a bus for one hour into the into the mountains. So let's play there. And they were just like thinking that I had gone mad. Uh -huh. uh, so it was a really hard hard one getting a, getting the band to believe in the idea, but uh, it turned out amazing. Even with the DVD, that, that was planned, I think, two or three days before. We thought, maybe we should film this. Are you serious? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we contacted everybody we knew with a camera <laughs> and invited them up. <laughs> that, that's how the DVD came to be? Just like you yeah. ask your friends? Yeah. Oh my God! That is... One of our friends, one of our friends worked in in TV, mm -hmm. so he was giving like uh, one one uh, a one day, uh, like one day before we gave him. Can you like tell people what to do and stuff, so we don't have everybody stand all the twenty two or I, don't, I can't remember if it was like twenty people or something standing on the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> so he did this kind of, yeah. He told people where to stand, and one was had to be on the top of the mountain all all evening, and yeah. you know. But uh, and then we had a friend who said that I'm going to edit it for you, and he used like two months, I think. I think he used maybe four or five hours every day for two months because there was, you know, so many different qu qualities on the cameras, for example. So it was twenty two angles. That's insane. Mm, mm. Maybe he didn't use everything in the end, but but mm -hmm. still, it was a huge job. Yeah. yeah. So that's a funny one. I don't think I've ever told anybody that before. Huh. <laughs> now, now, I understand that you guys have the distinction of having played both the first concert yeah. at the dam and the last one? And the last one, yeah. That was, you know, we needed to say when we came to back uh, came back together in 2014, it was like we had been talking a little bit about it like since, well, some of us since 2012 maybe. Maybe it would be cool to do something again one time, you know, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And when when and that first under the dam was so special for us, yeah. obviously. Um, so when uh, the message came from the local promoter that uh, they were going to tear down the entire dam, but yeah. they they can do one more uh, festival up there, and they wanted us to close it, you know, we had opened it, so they wanted us to close it, and that was like a good enough reason to try and see how it was to play together again in 2014. So so it was the dam being demolished that brought you guys back together in the end? Yeah, kind of. Wow. I don't know if it would happen anyway, because there was this like, today, Day of Darkness uh, anniversary coming up two years afterwards. But mm -hmm. then again, I you know, it's I'm not sure. Uh, and also for the End of the Dam Part 2 show, you know, there were people coming from all over the world that reminded us that people still remember us. People still, you know... Uh, respect us and we still mean something for people so that was a good you know a very a good motivation for us to to get back together to be honest with you man aren't you glad that you had that ridiculous idea to play at the dam in the first place <laughs> yeah yeah it was a, 
it was, you know, the story behind it, it's it's a little bit maybe Osama bin Laden's fault. Wait, um, wait what? <laughs> <laughs> they used to be at that festival, they used to have like this concept in inside like this power plant. So you, you had to walk for two kilometers into the like in, into like this mountain hall. If you know what I mean, you had to go into a mountain, into mm. this uh, uh, turbine or something like that. Maybe right. you know th- this uh, main part of a power plant, uh-huh. which was a huge room which they had concerts in. And after nine eleven, uh, there was this new anti terror laws coming, mm-hmm. so they they couldn't, uh, you know, have a concert in in the middle of a mountain. Oh. Like so, they they moved it. Uh, to under a dam, and I've just thought that, like, if the terrorists are gonna strike that little place with eight inhabitants, I think maybe the dam would be just as <laughs> as efficient <laughs> as that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. No, it was a it was a really, really, really special show for us. That first, that first um, under the dam. And I think actually that has defined quite a lot for Green Carnation when think allowing ourselves to think big, you know. And uh, understanding what you need to do in order to, you know, from a good idea and to um, to be able to to have a, like a successful end to it, you know, mm-hmm. there's many, there are so many elements into like a project like that. And I learned also a lot from the local promoter, which is a, like a genius, I think, when it comes to to um, to communicating. So we we sold. One minute after we put out the tickets for sale, mm-hmm. there were two tickets uh, going to New York. Wow! So from from being like this local event, uh, he managed to to tell the local, you know, the people in this area that this is going to be like a huge event for, with people from all over the world coming, mm-hmm. which makes the local people more curious. Obviously, you know, what is this? <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So it was the under the under the dam thing was so like yeah it was amazing. Before we go on, um, I do want to ask about about y'all's relationship with Tommy Jacksonville because like I know that he and Stein are still in a band together at least. Oh yeah, 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 checked. yeah. Um, but like he, Tommy wrote one of my favorite Green Carnation songs, "Transparent Me." High Tide Waves. Uh, oh, yeah, he wrote that one, too. You're right. I'd forgotten. So, like, uh, uh, is everything cool with you guys? Like, is there still a possibility that that you might collaborate with him again the same way you have been with Michael and Bjorn? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, as you said, like, we, again, we're in a small town, so we meet all these people all the time. And, and Stan Orgel and Tommy goes way, way, way back. And Tommy always plays on Stan Orgel's uh, bands and projects and he's been doing that for almost 30 years i guess you know wow. so we're in the same family still and uh, we meet uh, we meet uh, quite often everybody you know so no it's not it's nothing um it's it's not no no hostile feelings but i, I still think tommy wanted to do the light of daily of darkness um reunion mm-hmm. um but but we needed it to 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 be uh, somebody else because Tommy is an amazing drummer mm-hmm. and what he did on the acoustic verses and and you know our shows that you saw as well mm-hmm. like I, I don't think we could have had any better drummer than Tommy because he's and he's such a, such, such a great guy to hang out with as well so so it's like but but sometimes it's it's like I think maybe one of the things I've learned uh, the most of was that the huge, huge differences between something that's 95, 96% and 100%. Those last few percentages is like, it's so, it's so hard and it's so, everything needs to be perfect for it to be perfect. And if nothing's, if something's not perfect with it, and it can be whatever, it can mm-hmm. be just a guitar sound or whatever, uh, things would, wouldn't be like it should be, you know? So, so I think it's also to do with nothing to do with Tommy's um, the qualities as a drummer because he's he's such an amazing drummer. But when it, he didn't play on Light of Day, of Darkness, you know. Yeah. You know, so so we needed somebody who could, you know, do Light of Day, of Darkness like we needed it to be done. If you know what I mean. I see. Okay. 
also, I'm not going to like speculate, but I think like it would be really, really hard to find somebody who could do what Tommy did on uh, on on the acoustic verses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in so metal. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm. So yeah, it's it's a bit. I, I've been working as a as an advisor for for younger bands in my my previous job. Okay, and and, and you know that thing isn't necessarily because when you start off playing in a band, it's it's more like a social thing, you know. Mm-hmm. You play there with your you, with your friends first and foremost, and first and foremost to have fun, and then may, maybe other aspects come into your your band sphere when it comes to quality and stuff. Because and 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 then and then you realize maybe that quality can be so many different things. Uh, for example, for example, the quality of a drummer on two different records, if mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So it's absolutely nothing to do with Tommy's quality as a drummer because he's one of the best drummers I know. Yeah. But then again, then again, uh, a certain you know, especially maybe like today, Day of Darkness, who is such a, which is such a, like a special album, mm-hmm. and and yeah, that's that's the <clears throat> that's the story kind of. But um, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Mm. Okay. Well, 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 thanks for talking about that. I wasn't sure if I was treading on like forbidden territory or anything like that. So no, no, no. It's it's hard to say because sometimes you know break it, like people who uh, are you know quitting in bands and stuff. There might be some horrible you know reasons behind it, and I don't think it is. Now, now you guys returned to the country that was you know almost completely responsible for your breakup. Uh, <laughs> back in 2016, mm. and you guys did Light of Day, Day of Darkness, that we've referenced many, many times during this discussion. You guys played the whole album in its mm. entirety. Mm. I was there. It was awesome. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was that was quite amazing. And the response also from the crowd. I thought that was a perfect festival for us to play on. Like, if we were to choose one place to play in mm. in the US after so many years. That's such a well-run festival, and it's oh, such a great venue and everything. So we we really, really had a great time there. You know, so I've been to that festival many, many times. Yeah. And, and that is the only time I can think of where the entire audience was completely silent and completely yeah. focused on the band. Uh, and I'm talking specifically specifically about uh, about Michael's bazooki solo. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. was not a sound coming out of that audience. It was surreal. Yeah, it, it's that was one of the things that we were discussing before because we needed to redo that part, you know, because we we couldn't bring um, a saxophone player and a soprano singer on those shows because mm-hmm. of practical and economical reasons. So we needed to let's try and recreate that atmosphere that was on the original album, but with what we could do as a band. And we came up with that buzuki and this uh, vocoder or whatever thing it was on keyboards. <laughs> yeah. And um, and we were like, are people gonna are we are we gonna hear this on stage? Are people gonna be drunk and talking loudly <laughs> during this? You know, and it that didn't happen on any of the shows. On every show, there was like complete silence on that part, and and also the other silent parts, which mm-hmm. I think is interesting and and which is something i've been <clears throat> trying and figure out why you know um because after i'm just just going on here but but it's i think it's very interesting because after after playing those lights of day day of darkness anniversary shows we put on put put a, like a, a new set list we worked with mm-hmm for the live shows that because we don't want to play like a half ass version of like today day of darkness right. uh, in in a regular set because uh, we we've, we've done the full version and that should be good enough <laughs> um but we kind of struggle a little bit with you know that the, the thing with um like today day of darkness live is like it's so intense and people were like coming over to me after the gigs and they've been crying and they were like like as we say in Norway, uh, chewed and spit out again, you know, like mentally. It's like, it was draining mentally for people. Yeah. And, and I think that's because 
at the beginning of Light of Day, Day of Darkness, we invite somebody into like an atmosphere with lots of emotions and everything and lots of, you know, music and power and and sadness and maybe even a little bit of happiness. And we keep them there for one hour. We don't let them go for one single second. It never stops, like, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's something that we've learned a lot from and trying to, to recreate in the sets, even though the songs might be not one hour long. It's like the concert stuff, and then it stops. It's not like 10 different parts, like if we play 10 songs, it's just one part and everything needs to work together. So that's like, um, that's like, I think, a really interesting way of seeing a live show is that it starts when you go on stage and you never stop until you're off stage. Yeah. Mm. I I agree with you 100% on that, where you Mm. just like bring them in. And hold them there and do not let them go for the entirety of the set until you're finished. Yeah, and that's what, why we kind of right now we're working on. There's not going to be any silence during our shows. It's mm-hmm. not going to be like even if the guitarists have to to tune the guitars, there should be something happening because people shouldn't lose concentration and and focus. Yeah, because because then we're going to be able to how can you say to to share what we want from the stage, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm. So it's a little bit philosophical, but I think like, that's something you think about when when you've been doing music for many years, you find those those things really interesting. And that's got to do with what's in your heads, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, got to do with the psychological uh, matters as well, uh, which I find really interesting. It's, you know, now that I think about it, not only... Not only is that the only time I've ever seen that audience go completely silent, I think that it's the first time it, that I've seen that in any metal show that I've attended. Maybe, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, and again, it's like I would be surprised if all of the people in the Atlanta crowd knew exactly what Light of Day, Day of Darkness was about, you know, because it is a, it is a heavy story and oh, yeah. everything. No, but then again, when you know what you want to do, and you do it with like full confidence and stuff, that will people would notice that. Like these people want to say something. I should listen, even though I don't know what it is from before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why you know rehearsing for one and a half years on that <laughs> that one song, which sounds <laughs> a bit stupid. We didn't rehearse like every day, but still. Right. Like, it was in progress for one and a half years. Mm-hmm. That's what you achieve with, with doing that. And that's, again, from being 95 to 100%, uh, it's a big difference. Yeah. And maybe maybe some people would fall off if we were just 90 or 95% focused on what we were going to do, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. I do. And plus, I mean, that's also like a really, really lofty goal. I mean, because you guys had been had been on hiatus for over a decade, and then you decide to come back with this you guys yeah. either had to be like really high minded or completely out of your minds. Mm. Maybe it may, maybe a combination. But probably. <laughs> <laughs> now, now yeah. at the Atlanta show, uh, sure, the guy that wrote that song wasn't there. That's true. We decided not to not to kind of make a big uh, big fuss out of that because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's because. Um, <laughs> well, uh oh. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, but we didn't know that before. You know, he was waiting for that visa until, you know, the day before we left. And it didn't arrive until we came back. Is it is it because of some silly things he did when he was young? Yeah. Okay, but, but he toured the United States before. Yeah, and that wasn't uh, very easy either. Hmm. Uh, but he managed to get to the U.S. and then... We were waiting for him for a few hours uh, at the airport before he actually let in. Oh wow! It's because because what he did was so long ago that they they cannot see what he did. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But they can see how long he was in prison. Which was how long? Uh, uh one or two years. Okay. Hmm. Huh. Mm. Uh, so so that would mean that there was something not not a petty crime, like you know. Yeah. But I think since that time, since after, because this was before and after 9-11, you know, mm-hmm. I think that alarm goes at the American side 
when we're still in Norway instead of when we're at the airport trying to get in. Mm-hmm. I think <clears throat> so. That's why. That's why uh, he was in. You know, the the, the visa ap- applications came in two different uh, uh, two different boxes. You know, like we we got we got it quite fast, but he was in another box and which wasn't prior prioritized. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. So, so you guys just prepared for the worst and rehearsed with two guitars instead of three? Well, we had one rehearsal with two guitarists. Oh wow! Actually, and that oh. was a bit. Wow. That was a bit. Um, but then again, when you have somebody like Michael, um, uh, who's like an in- incredible musical talent, mm-hmm. um, we managed to do that. But if we had like three different guitarists uh, for example short could never replace what beyond us on one real like he could never do it mm-hmm. because they have two different so different styles but um but with um with michael is um, beyond could never have done what uh, short short does but michael is so like he can do everything basically mm-hmm. so he just needed to i know the song i know the song and I just gonna do what Talia does, and it worked out really well. So, <laughs> and it wasn't like we were devastated, like ner- nervous, uh, extremely nervous and stuff. But still, it was when we knew that okay, we're gonna do have to do a rehearsal without short, and mm-hmm. maybe that's the only rehearsal before we're gonna do a quite important show in the US. Mm-hmm. But um, but on stage, it was like yeah. We knew it was going to work out. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was just a magical experience. It easily, easily up at the top of all the performances that I've been there. That's probably been the most moving one. And yeah, it that's was um, saying something. It's a strange thing, and and, and when it comes to that, I think that maybe well, you know the first show we did uh, with that concept was in Bergen at Blastfest. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. We had a really good slot uh, on the main stage and everything, mm-hmm. um, and we had prepared so well on everything. But when we were watching into the crowd, and w- when I could count like at least ten people crying during uh, like a uh, one one specific you know time during the concert, yeah. and all the other guys in the band saw that, I don't think we were prepared to that kind of strong reaction from the crowd. Like we knew, we know the nature of light of day, day of darkness, but maybe we had forgotten a little bit about how, how much people actually can relate to that. And obviously some of those people was a bit emotional that we were even back on stage. Mm -hmm. So that was like an incredibly emotional concert. And I think we actually, well, I wouldn't say we played badly, but but we were discussing that afterwards. And like we have to be prepared for that kind of reaction on the next show because, yeah. because yeah, because you know. And that next show was at the um, Roadburn Festival in in the, in the Netherlands, which was like oh, on this amazing venue in in Tilburg. And uh, yeah, it was those shows were really special. And and there was something with all the shows that we we wanted to do better. Because we want, we needed it to be one hundred percent perfect when we were going to record that yeah. last show in our hometown of Christensen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I was thinking before that, so there's so many things that can go wrong. Just like because Short is starting off every theme basically on that song mm-hmm. alone, and then the rest of the guys, you know, are introduced. Mm-hmm. What if he forgets a theme and and starts on on a different theme? And we have uh, ten, 10 cameras there. We cannot really, you know, you can't stop and it's concert and everything. How what are we going to do then? You know? hmm. And even, you know, the power can go and everything can go wrong during a <laughs> during concert. But on that exact concert, mm-hmm. we did the best show we did the in, entire year. I wow. think that I rate, I rate the Atlanta one very highly myself, but but obviously that was without shorts. So it was still, you know, it wasn't perfect, kind of for us because of that, but but it was per it was perfect uh, um, for for the ones you know who were there, and we played we played the concert as we should do, and it was really great. But 
But for us, that was like a little bit of an anticlimax for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we wanted everything to be perfect on the DVD shot. So luckily it was. <laughs> yeah, like... Like from the audience side, I mean, those of us that have been diehards for a long time definitely notice, hey, Jordy's not yeah, there. Of course. Um, but, but it did not make the performance any less intense. You know, uh, you know, you guys made up for that. And, and the people who were not familiar with you guys before, mm-hmm. uh, walked away very, very impressed with what you guys did. Uh, you guys were the talk of the weekend. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, Glenn and the guys in the in the crew were also like really enthusiastic, which means a lot mm-hmm. because of, because those guys pay a lot of money for us to go over there and play. We we did one show in in Canada as well, mm-hmm. uh, but 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 basically the entire economy in that trip was was Glenn and and the guys in in Prog Power. So of course you wanna you wanna repay that belief and stuff. So there's also kind of a little bit of a you know, pride thing going on there as well, because when Glenn, the cool thing about what he did that not too many other ones like do when we were discussing, uh, you know, the payment for the band, he sent the entire, uh, all, all of the numbers, Mm -hmm. what it cost, what it would cost him to, to host us there. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of prepared for that, but some of the guys in the band was like, okay, so this is like, <laughs> it's it's like they actually invest quite a lot of money in giving their audience like a Green Carnation concert. It's yeah. not only, but because we only see the money that comes into our account, you know, mm-hmm. basically. And you don't think about how much it actually costs, you know. Somebody's going to pick us up at the airport. Somebody's going to feed us. Somebody, you know, we're going to have the two nights in a hotel and blah, blah, blah. There's... And, and technical rent and you know everything so, it's a so, massive yeah. undertaking it is it is it is yeah yeah it's a massive undertaking but like there's there's a reason that that festival has such a sterling reputation it's because yeah. they know what they're doing and oh yeah indeed you yeah, know it was easy to easy to see like just by talking talking with glenn you know you get a stomach feeling when you've done this for a few years and i was like since we signed the contract, I knew that it was, this was going to be a great experience for the band because it's just the way he speaks. Are you ready to talk about the new music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been drooling for this one for years, years, <laughs> and I finally heard the album uh, start to finish yesterday. Mm. So, so I haven't really had a chance to get very familiar with it. But, no, no. but, but, but the more that I listen to it, the more that I love it. Um, mm-hmm. I was really surprised, though. That it's only five songs. Yep. What's up with that, dude? <laughs> Come on, it's been sixteen <laughs> years since your last record, and you're giving us five songs. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we, we've been prepared for that question, to be honest with you. And uh, there's uh, there's a few different reasons why the album is like it is. One of the reasons is that it was originally planned to be an EP. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it was originally planned to, you know, keep the wheels running until our next big project that I hinted about uh, half, half an hour ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, the thing we've been working with this album since 2017, and um, we've been discussing a lot, like talking a lot upfront on what we want to achieve with this album. And the most important thing for us was to let's. Uh, make an album which is very Green Carnation Anno 2020 or 19 when it was recorded. We wanted to bring into the album uh, the most important elements and qualities we found when searching in all directions in the first you know, hiatus of the band. Um, because also when working on our, our live sets now, we, we, we are like, what is the unique sides of reincarnation what is making reincarnation what it is what does you know people like with reincarnation when it heard? What, what do we think that we do well and what do what are we not that comfortable with when it comes to to reincarnation you know so we mm-hmm. we were discussing a lot of things which we've never done before like mm-hmm. we've always just followed the direction somebody wanted to take and then let's do that but this time around it was much more of a like an analytic approach in in the early stages 
like that. So like we wanted what we knew what kind of album we wanted to make. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and <clears throat> um, we started off with a couple of new songs, um, which was supposed to make the basis of you know the EP. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it was you know the first and second song on the album was was the two first songs yeah yeah like i i specifically like like what you just said about like uh, about the sound on the new album leaves of yesteryear like being very deliberate and very calculated like that that kind of comes through in the opening cut the title track like yeah. it has like all the hallmarks <laughs> of the classic green carnation sounds <laughs> Yeah, you know it's got the epic, doomy, melancholic, progressive, retro, weird shit, and it's perfect. <laughs> um, and like it really, really encapsulates the entire band's essence. It and condenses it into one song. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's on purpose, and and also it became clearer for us that we want this this new album to kind of uh, to build a bridge. Uh, like to gather the entire history of the band and and do it in a fresh way mm-hmm. to to say and then and then we we've been thinking about that live as well the last couple of years and then we started working like if we're gonna build a bridge between you know the old and new reincarnation we shouldn't forget our first album yeah and how on earth would like something from the first album sound with the lineup from today. Mm-hmm. So we started working on My Dark Reflections of Life and Death because we wanted to play it live. And we have for... Um, so we made we, we decided to make a version. How would we make that song today? So we, hmm. we decided also to have some, you know, artistic freedom when it came to, you know, that team. Uh, we wouldn't play that team that way if we made it. So we kind of recomposed, I would say, that mm-hmm. song. That I'll song, play. that song, oh, we're talking about My Dark Reflections yeah. and yeah. Light of Day? Uh, uh, yeah, because My Dark Reflections, mm-hmm. this is a long story. I'll just see if you can you can follow me here. Because sure, sure. My Dark Reflections of Life and Death is the basis of Light of Day, Day of Darkness. Ah. Yes. Okay. So Light of Day, Day of Darkness is just like, um, it's it's like an elaborate, ver- like an elaborate, uh, not version of, but elaborate um, next step mm-hmm. from my dark reflections of life and death. Therefore, my dark reflections of life and death is a very important song in the Green Carnation heritage. Uh, therefore, that song was important. It's also twenty years ago. Obviously, that song was was released. We have a completely different lineup in the band from the first album to light of day, day of darkness. This is what I was talking about when I said that, like, I wish that I had more time to get familiar with it because yep. it hadn't even crossed my mind that it was a reinterpretation of a song from, you know, from the very first green carnation album. Yeah, it is. So, so there is a lot of reason. It's it, again, it's it, everything is really well thought of, <laughs> yeah. but it's not, but, but still, I think if people didn't know anything about this, mm-hmm. I still think they would enjoy that song mm-hmm. kind of because I'm really happy with the version. But there is many like underlying reasons why it's on the album. Um, so, um, and also when we were discussing, like when we saw how, like what is the main, what is this album about? You mm-hmm. know, what's the musical and lyrical identity of the album? And then we suddenly had this <laughs> this version of um, of solitude by Black Sabbath that we've yes. been working on since 2017 for a different idea, huh. which was like it's kind of a acoustic live in the studio YouTube series okay. that we were thinking about. Which was we've been working with a couple of songs, but the one we started with was actually solitude by Black Sabbath. Hmm. Then when we saw what, you know, the lyrics of the album and and the atmosphere on the album, and somebody said one time, like, oh, this album needs solitude. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. It's like it's written for that, this album, we, we, we think at least, uh, because it's about exactly the same things as, as we, were, we were, you know, um, talking about. In, in the lyrics and the atmosphere in that song is like the perfect way to 
to close the record. And it's it might sound a bit like uh, pomp pompous or whatever the, the the word is, but but it, it for us it's like that song was written for this album for us. So no, no, that makes natural. sense. That makes sense, yeah. and, and like that actually like kind of relates to something that I wanted to ask because like every other time that you guys have done covers, you know, cover versions of other songs, they were always like bonus tracks or b-sides or whatever yeah uh, yeah yeah and they've never actually been officially on an album mm. so so yeah like what you're saying makes sense yeah it does and and then people can be you know happy or disappointed that like out of five songs there is one re-recorded song mm -hmm. and one cover song but for us i don't think this album would have been would have been complete without those two mm -hmm. uh those two songs because because again, you know, as I said, you know, the big centerpiece, the 16-minute centerpiece, which is our own song from 20 years ago, yeah. builds a strong bridge to Light of Day, Day of Darkness. And Light of Day, Day of Darkness is produced by the same guy who produced this album. And, mm -hmm. you know, so so we've been trying to, to gather all the important elements of Reincarnation into this album yeah. with, a, you know, 2020 twist to it, of course. Man, like... I, I'm kind of ashamed of myself for not picking up on that because, like, no. <laughs> to be completely honest, like, I just don't listen to the first Reincarnation album a whole lot. I, you know, I just, no. pre I just prefer the ones that that came out after. So, yeah. so yeah, that's a, I think that's a great move. I think so as well. It's it's a very unconventional move, I think, especially when when thinking that out of the forty five minutes. Um, of the new album, like 16 Minutes, is uh, a cover song by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you make it work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so as well. And I think most people who just listen to the album wouldn't even think that that was a re-recorded song or anything because it suits so well on the album. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, you fooled me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Hey. So you you did some really really interesting things with your voice on Sentinels. Oh, yeah. Mm, well, not, maybe not growling, but the the way into the chorus. You think? Yeah, that's exactly mm. what I was talking about. Mm. Yeah, I'm you know constantly trying to challenge myself um, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to using my voice, but basically it's just got to do with you know what the song needs. Mm -hmm. And I have to try and make it work. And um, I think it may be more, it's not a carrying element of that song, but I still think that I tried out some different stuff, but we ended up with doing that because it suited the song. And uh, yeah, uh, I like trying out new things. And, and um, a singer would always, you know, develop. And... Um, when I listened back to Light of Day, Day of Darkness, that was my very, very first album in the studio ever. Oh. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a... <laughs> yeah, Trot asked me That's... to... Yeah. That had to have been intimidating. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hadn't really been in any bands before joining Reincarnation, but I've been in a like a Faith No More cover band oh. as a singer, which, is, which, is, um, which I'm still in, and Jonathan is still the drummer there. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. And the guitarist of Trade of Tears is still a guitarist. The, the, like it's it's like, like old friends. Oh, so, that, that's awesome. Mm. So we've been doing that for twenty years plus now. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but Trot had heard about. He never heard me sing actually when we asked when he asked me to to join Reincarnation. That's uh, yeah, that's really a good one. Yeah. So uh, and I and. I had just heard of Chort because he was kind of a famous guy in, in our region mm -hmm. when it came to, you know, his metal, like black metal past and everything, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, he said that now yeah, we're going to do this, you know, this project that's going to be like a, a long song and a lot you want to join. <laughs> yeah. Can I hear some demos? And there was basically just some themes, like um, some parts of it with no vocals on. Mm -hmm. And we went to the studio and made everything in the studio. And and it's such a hugely ambitious thing that, you know, that one hour thing and everything. I, I think if I knew the amount of work and the level of ambitions on that album, mm -hmm. I 
with my experience today, I think maybe I would have said no today because. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but I was completely like um, new to the game, so I didn't, I didn't know how difficult it was. So maybe that was a good thing. <laughs> wow, mm. I, I did not know that about you. I did not know that Light of Day, Day of Darkness was your first album ever. It was, it yeah. was, and uh, wow. And then we were booked to the Wacken Festival, and then we did like one warm-up show back in Christiansand. And uh-huh. uh, on my second show as a singer, we I was playing at the world's biggest metal festival. So that was like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What an interesting yeah. story. Yeah, it's uh, I, yeah, it's a funny one. Uh, <laughs> but but the, when it comes to vocals, you know, but when if you hear um, the live. Last Day of Darkness that we did uh, in 2016, mm-hmm. and compare the vocal work to to the original Light of Data Darkness recording. You know, you you would have guessed uh, which one is the young version and which one is the more experienced version of a singer. Of course, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's it's all it's all like a, <clears throat> it's all a part of the development of yourself as a you know technical you know actual singer and but i think more more important you know uh, experience when it comes to being in the studio being playing concert and also life experience i guess which i think you can hear life experience in how people sing i mean i think that you can hear life experience like just watching your catalog you know as yeah. it progresses because i mean like it it touches not, not just on so many different like sounds like sonic aspects of music or whatever like it, it almost sounds like like somebody living their life and documenting yeah. it in song yeah yeah and and i think also with the new album uh, i think that's really it's also like lyrically and 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 what it's about it's also oh i, I haven't talked about this in any other interviews but but um so uh, I, i'm like thinking Along with talking here, but okay. um, it's I, I said that we wanted to kind of gather all the elements of reincarnation in all the best elements of reincarnation into one record, you know, mm-hmm. and that is also like lyrically. And then you see what kind of lyrics that Steiner Roger wrote for the three new songs, and you mm-hmm. see what kind of lyrics that Short wrote mm-hmm. on the on the long song in in two thousand. Mm-hmm. And you could basically think it would be not the same person writing it, but it's about exactly the same things, mm. <laughs> which is also a nice thing when it mm. comes to, you know, us wanting to, to to bring together, because these lyrics were written 20 years apart from each other. Mm-hmm. And they're basically about the same things. And that yeah. wasn't something that we planned from before, but that's something we've seen when when discussing if is uh, my dark reflections of life and death coming on the album or not? Uh-huh. Yeah, of, of course it is because it's exactly the same as uh, you know the new songs kind of. Yeah, you, you know what what you just said about like this twenty year old song, you know, being in line with the stuff that uh, that Stun Roger has written for this new record. <laughs> it, I mean, there, there's two different ways that, that I see anyway. It looks like there's yeah. two different ways that you could look at it. One is that you haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but but the other, the more realistic one is that you guys have come full circle. Yeah, kind of. I, I think I think the full circle uh, word is maybe something that we've been looking for as well. Uh, and when saying full circle, we I've, I've said in some interviews that this is kind of a, um, a tribute to the band's past, present, mm-hmm. and future. So when saying full circle. Normally things would stop when it's full circle, but I think it's basically a new start for us to kind of to start o- to start all over again, uh, respecting the band's um, legacy and the band's history and everything, you know, and and having gather everything together for for the next few years. Man, I think that is a really poetic way to look at things. That's mm. it. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of. Wow. Well, you've been more than generous with your time uh, with me. We've already been on the phone for over an hour. So, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, I like. I, I want to th- like give my sincerest gratitude to you for not just for 
taking so much time, you know, to talk with me about this, but also for putting out so much music that has meant so much to me over the years. Like I can't, I can't express to you in words how much Green Carnation has meant to me. You know, since like 2002 when I discovered you guys. It's, yeah, <laughs> like, it's a few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 thank you. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you. It was a different interview because I'm doing quite a lot of interviews right now, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, I have to say that like most of the people doing the interviews have uh, know the band quite a lot, but. But your questions and everything was very different from from everybody else's, which was making me maybe <laughs> talking a little bit more freely about things. And I've even touched into quite a lot of things today that I haven't really talked too much about, oh. uh, like the more philosophical sides to it, <clears throat> which, uh, which was really nice. Anyway, yeah. Well, t- well, thank you for saying that. That, that that's that's awesome to hear. Hmm. It's very nice. That was Hedel Nordus, the looming ice giant and enigmatic frontman of the Norwegian progressive epic doom band Green Carnation. Green Carnation reunited in 2014 after an acrimonious split in 2007, and they've since released the stellar live set Last Day of Darkness. Their upcoming album is called Leaves of Yesteryear, and it is being released on May 8th in the United States by Seasons of Mist. It's going to be available at the Season of Mist shop on CD, LP, and download, and a t-shirt bundle is also available, and those bad boys are going to be shipping very soon. Don't forget to check us out at sonicperspectives.com for lots of metal and prog-related goodness. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Insta, Twitter, and of course, you can subscribe to us on the Podblaster of your choice. We're going to write out with the title track from the upcoming Green Carnation album. This is the track that Chettle and I mentioned brought everything Green Carnation represents into one song. This cut is called Leaves of Yesteryear. It's always loneliness. Still hear the soldiers marching on. Oh. 